Hi, welcome to the pre-forum. I'm uh, um, Jürgen Hagler. I'm uh, the director of the Ars Electronica Animation Festival, and it's a pleasure, uh, pleasure for me to introduce you to the pre-forum to the category computer animation uh, pre-category. Uh, this year we had uh, a lot of submissions, in total 960 submissions. Uh, the jury session was uh, in the uh, end of uh, March, the beginning of April, and this was of course uh, a very challenging situation. We had uh, invited a very great uh, jury. On jury was uh, Peter Burr, uh, he is a filmmaker from Brooklyn, New York and he was uh, awarded a honorary mention in uh, 2018. Uh, Birgitta Hosea, she is professor at the University of Creative Arts Farnham. She was uh, um, on jury the second time and uh, she is a um, researcher in the field of expanded animation. Matilda Laven, she is uh, um, a filmmaker and she got the golden knicker two years ago in the category computer animation. And also Eric O was on jury. He gave a presentation yesterday at the Symposium Expanded Animation. He is uh, an animator, a filmmaker, and uh, a very talented media artist. Mimi Son uh, from uh, South Korea is 50% uh, of uh, artists to kimchi chips. Uh, they got uh, an award of distinction for their projects Light Barrier in 2017. So uh, the jury was, uh, the jury session was online and uh, of course uh, we were facing um, um, a very um, interesting um, uh, issue uh, because uh, we started here in Austria at uh, 4 uh, p.m. Uh, Birgitta was joining at 3 p.m. in London, but uh, um, uh, Eric O was uh, in, um, in uh, uh, L.A. and was joining us uh, very early in the morning. And at the same time, Mimi Son uh, was uh, joining the jury session at uh, midnight. So this was really challenging and of course uh, we had a lot of uh, um, great pieces to watch. Uh, the jury started uh, with an, uh, a discussion what is uh, computer animation in uh, this context of Ars Electronica, in this context of uh, um, media arts. Nowadays, uh, this is one quote from the jury session, the formal definition of this category have been blurry for years, isn't that animation moved through, that all animation moved through a computer at some points now. So uh, they discussed a couple of criteria like innovation in animation, in uh, telling stories, but also using technology, uh, diversity, but the connection to Ars Electronica, to uh, the main pillars, art, technology, and society was of course uh, an aspect that was discussed, or should Ars Electronica award uh, crafts, uh, excellence in execution, but uh, at the end uh, they, came to a common ground uh, with a couple of criteria, and they picked a uh, uh, couple of honorary, great honorary mentions, two award of distinctions and the golden knicker. All the works receiving awards and honorary mentions came from a very wide representation. So what is a computer animation? There have been selected uh, animated shorts, but also VR projects, audio, visual, reactive installations, site-specific installations. Uh, so it's really a, a very broad range. Uh, there are, of course, ongoing trends since uh, the last years, like uh, VR projects, 3D scanning, using uh, new technology like generative adversarial networks uh, in the field of animation, but also real-time processing projects uh, using game engines in, uh, within um, a computer animation. So common themes are in this top 15 projects, uh, social media, also a female gaze that was uh, highlighted by the churros, and uh, alternative perspectives uh, to dystopian universe. Um, some of them were kind of witty humorous uh, and uh, a critical reflection as well. So uh, we will start the pre-forum uh, with uh, the presentations of the top prize winners, uh, followed by uh, the award ceremony and the 
pre-forum discussions with the prize winners, uh, with Peter Burr, who was on jury, and he will discuss with uh, the um, prize winners uh, current trends in the field of computer animation. So it's a pleasure uh, to um, feature uh, the Golden Nika winner, Miva Matrejek. Uh, she will introduce uh, her project, Inf Infinitely Yours. It's a prime example in the field of expanded animation in this context of performance, uh, um, being on stage, live performance, computer animation, and uh, critical reflection. Uh, Concluded with uh, the two Award of Distinction winners, Maya Gehring, she will uh, uh, introduce her project Average, Average Happiness. This is a short movie that tackles uh, uh, data from various uh, backgrounds and how to handle uh, uh, the data in public space. Uh, so this is really a very current discussion as well. And Randa Marufi, the second award of distinction, uh, will, uh, winner will introduce uh, the project Bob Scepter. So stay tuned, enjoy the presentation, and also join the award ceremony and the discussion later on. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mia Matrejek, and I'm honored to be awarded the Golden Nika for computer animation for Ars Electronica this year. I am a Los Angeles-based animator, designer, and performer, making work that combines projected animation and live performance. My work often tries to imagine invisible systems of micro and macro scales, as well as express concepts and visualize metaphors. My new piece, Infinitely Yours, is a dreamlike or maybe more nightmarish interpretation of the climate crisis, born out of processing my own climate anxiety over the last few years. As part of the process, I collected news items to note take some of the imagery I wanted to integrate into the world of the piece. Deforestation, forest fires, ocean plastics, overfishing, pollution, peak oil, manufacturing of an unimaginable amount of unsustainable and quickly disposed products. These images consider what it means for the Earth to support a human population of 7.8 billion people. I've been working in the medium of combined performance and animation since my time as a grad student in the Experimental Animation Program at California Institute of the Arts. I began collaborating with people from theater, music, and puppetry to make interdisciplinary projects, which expanded my mind about where and how animation can be seen and experienced. Influenced by these collaborations, my MFA thesis project in 2007 was my first solo shadow and animation project. Since then, I have been fascinated by continuing to add complexity to my work to play with illusion and transformation and the compositions I can create with my shadow and animation. The shadow is a specific two-dimensional version of my female body, but also makes me somewhat like a symbol of a person, one that the audience might see as both real and ephemeral. The shadow is cinematic in that it could be one-to-one -one scale to my body or become larger than life, like a close-up. Combined with the animation, I can create POV shifts, pans, zooms, and other compositions in mise-en-scene familiar from the language of cinema, while the audience constantly is aware that I am creating these effects in real time with my body. By being present and having the risk of mistake and failure, the shadow is a vessel to make an empathetic connection with the audience, to bring them along on the journey of the surreal narratives of the animation. Unfortunately, I can only show documentation videos for the Arts Electronica events this year rather than doing a live performance because of the global pandemic. 
I'm excited to show my work live again in front of a physical audience when the world is safer. I love the magic connection I feel to be co-present and sharing a space of imagination and co-creation with the audience. In my work, the shadow silhouette is not one character, but can represent a multitude of perspectives. In moments, the shadow represents the experience of an individual person, like being stuck in a car in traffic, but also in moments represent the experience of society or humanity, such as reaching into the ground and pulling out oil to eat up hungrily. Sometimes a shadow represents Earth or Gaia, watching as the surface of the planet is transformed rapidly through human history. The shadow switches at a turn from being the creator to the created, the destroyer to the destroyed. Throughout the process of making this piece and later showing it, it's been interesting that certain world events make the images feel resonant again and again. I first imagined the wildfire scenes from the fires in California, but the scene felt timely again with the fires in Brazil and later the fires in Australia. And of course, California is on fire again now. Infinitely Yours is made using After Effects, Photoshop, and Premiere. I tend to make work like a collage artist, deconstructing and layering images and video footage, and manipulating and rebuilding them in layers upon layers into new moving images and meanings. Even though my work is made digitally, there's a lot that relies on the handmade and every day, from the presence of my body live behind the screen, and the paper forest object that I start and end the piece with, as well as other tangible objects in shadow, like the plastic bottle. Much of the imagery and the video footage come from my daily life. The trash in the ocean scene are my own trash that I shot footage of and animated. The oil field is built out of videos and photos I took while on a road trip in central California. The living room is my own apartment, shot and rebuilt into the piece. All of the music in Infinitely Yours is by my friend Morgan Sorn. He was generous to let me look through his vast discography of music and find songs that felt right per scene. The music acted as a backbone for me to structure the flow of images from one to the next and gives the emotional arc to the performance. For some versions of the touring shows, Morgan is able to come with me and perform live, which is exciting. What is animation? For me, Animation is giving life by visual manipulation of time, space, and ideas, a manifested illusion. By the animator's hands, image and meaning are bent to create a new reality. A dream logic of one image following the other, time and physics bending to create a visual world that only the animator can bring into being, channeled through the personality of their unique mind and hands. How do I make animation? I had always thought about animation through my body. When I was making short films, my hands, eyes, and body were often integrated into the collaged images as rotoscoped elements. Often even the original conception of my projects come from an embodied imagination, channeled through my body and through gestures. I am often asking myself questions like, what would the earth feel like to desire connection with the universe? to reach out and touch the moon. And through performing this feeling for the camera, attempt to create an emotional connection to the idea. I have rarely been interested in telling the story of a person or a character, but rather of perspectives that are often conceptual and larger than life, such as the perspectives of the earth, of a disaster, or the weather system. What does it mean to make animation with performance? 
I have been investigating my unique form of combining live performance and animation for over a decade. I consider my main practice to be the solo shadow silhouette work, but I also sometimes make short films, as well as work in a more theater-based way with my collaborative multimedia theater company, Cloud Eye Control, and as a designer for other theater and dance companies. For me, as a performer inside of my animations, I am very much interested in the audience's perception, what they see, interpret, and experience while watching my work. For me, telling my stories through a female body is very important. One, there are already a lot of stories about men out there. Two, this is the body I have and experience the world through. I am also interested in working in this digital medium but infusing my work with tenderness, care, and strength, as well as panic, fear, and despair, and a wide range of other emotions. After spending almost two years to make Infinitely Yours, I am now in the process of a new creation, a child. I redocumented the performance for the Ars Electronica event as I felt my current body add a layer of meaning to the themes of this piece. And it was definitely something I had been thinking about and struggling with in the process of making this work. What it means to be cared for by the earth. What it means to care for the earth. Where we are now and the future that we want to provide for the next generation. Thank you. Hello, I'm the director of Average Happiness, which won the prize of distinction for 2D animation this year at Ars Electronica. And now I'm invited to discuss um, the following question with you. What is animation? For me this question is almost as difficult as the question what is your favorite film? Because I like a lot of different films for different reasons. And animation can be different things. So animation can basically be anything and that's probably why I like it so much. Animation is moving image, mostly with sound. It is to make things move that normally are static, like a drawing or an object or a graph, in the case of every happiness. Animation is more than that. Animation is characterizing drawings, objects and graphs. It's bringing them to life. So the way that we get around this problem is to add what's called uh, a random disturbance term whose movements cause movements in one or more other variables. The movements that cause the... Uh, sorry, the variables that we're trying to explain uh, is usually called the dependent variable. Way back at school, you probably learned that how did I use animation in average happiness? First of all, the graphs are found footage. So there were already a lot of given parameters, how they looked, what color they have. So I used those parameters to think of a way how to move them and how to animate them. But mostly I was just intrigued by their forms and shapes and colors. It was more looking at those diagrams, thinking of how they could be understood as body parts or bodies. Portraits. But what I liked very much about working with vectors was that I could 
use the mistakes that you normally try to avoid to have a surprising effect. So what I did is I had these diagrams built in After Effects already and I was jumping from one point in the timeline to another and just erasing uh, anchor points with some of the diagrams. I realized that if I erase the anchor points like in a, in a specific order, um, they were doing very beautiful movements, wavy movements that uh, looked very uncontrolled and very natural. So I liked this effect very much and I used it quite a lot in the animation of every chappiness. Like for example with the red arrow I fixed the arrow in the front and I used this effect only uh, like in the, in the body of the red arrow. But uh, with other diagrams the, the movement is entirely made by erasing anchor points. a lot of replacement, for example with the um, population pyramids in the demonstration and forest scene. So when I had, for example, a population pyramids from the 1950s, the 1970s, the year 2000 and the year 2050, there were four different keyframes and I um, rendered the in-betweens in After Effects. I used found footage from the internet, quite a lot of different shapes, diagrams, colors, contexts. So in the end, maybe more important than the actual animation was the setting the the composition of the image because every chappiness has not a single topic I mean it has a topic being surrounded by diagrams that try to explain everything like even trying to measure happiness um, but the diagrams they have a single topic or they are in a specific context and I didn't want it to make a film about financial uh, world or gender issues or weapon sales. So I uh, needed to find a way to use as many diagrams as possible in the film to show this overdose and to show our use of these diagrams. First I thought of organizing the diagrams in a white cube to use for example many 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 bar charts and just put them in a space, in an abstract space layering them and playing around with them and uh, then I exchanged the white background with a black background and the image I got reminded me of the skyline of a big city in the night and that was uh, somehow the starting point when I decided to go for this setting that the diagrams are actually a city and some of the diagrams are characters in the city a very important role in the dramaturgical process uh, was Paul Bush and it was uh, for me very interesting to work with him. We discussed a lot and he also gave me some inputs and then uh, I used the city symphonies of the 30s to find a dramaturgy, still be able to have some sort of narration by using the city as a, as a place and using um, uh, like one day in the city of diagrams as a dramaturgical thread. Then I had another dilemma because I liked these diagrams on a white screen very much and somehow I didn't find uh, the images I wanted in the city. So 
I looked for another framework and I decided to use a PowerPoint presentation as a framework. The film is set in a PowerPoint presentation and people doze off and have dreams. And in this case, in the PowerPoint presentation we have diagrams and they doze off into a diagram city and go on a journey in that city. In practice, of course, a linear relationship doesn't mean that the points have to lie exactly on a straight line, simply that they have to lie roughly on a straight line. For example, if we follow... It was quite difficult to find the right PowerPoint presentation because I wanted to have it found footage as well. First I was checking for TED Talks, but the, the TED Talks have this selling mood. Uh, it was too enthusiastic for my taste. We're wealthier than ever, but unhappier than ever. We're more prosperous, but more depressed. We're less satisfied. I remember being shocked the first few times I went to Africa. What shocked me? It wasn't their poverty, but their happiness. Uh, then I was um, uh, looking for other lectures that were too nerdy, too jargony. So here we have the first derivative of the loss function with respect to p bar. Uh, and the optimal level is equal to zero. We just write uh, the same equation and we analyze just part of the left hand side and we know that this is 1 over 1 minus theta beta. And finally I found the lectures of Chris Brooks about econometrics and that was just the right mix between jargon and being enthusiastic about a topic, being involved in a topic because also it was important that this voice was appealing and not just annoying. So to give you a very uh, simple illustration, the first thing we should do is to plot the data in a scatter plot and just to have a look at the data and to see what its features are. In addition, I used the cursor as a narrative element. I also used the cursor to show how the lecturer is losing control about his PowerPoint presentation. And in the end, the cursor is even stimulating or triggering the diagrams. Making average happiness was a long process. That's normal in animation. But uh, for me it was very interesting. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, also to animate non-human figures. I like to work with metaphors, that's not something new. I like to give coincidence space in my work, but uh, every happiness was really something completely different for me. The next step of this project is to um, develop an interactive version. So uh, that was already a plan from the start. And we are now developing um, a concept for a game or an app where you can stimulate statistical diagrams and increase average happiness in the world. For me that is a completely new field um, to work on interactive narrations and I'm very curious how this is going to take average happiness to the next level. Thank you for your attention.
Hello, my name is Randa Marufi, the director of BEPSEPTA. First of all, I would like to thank Ars Electronica and the, the jury for this award uh, and for this invitation to talk about my work. I am really happy to share uh, my modest experience with you. Excuse my English, I'm going to read the translation of my presentation. The field of my experiments extends from the occupation of public space to the question of gender of which I identify the mechanism of construction. My research lies between reportage, cinema and sociological analysis. I consider myself multidisciplinary or rather undisciplined and cannot confine myself to a single form of expression. And the film medium accepts this position in the sense that making a film can appeal to the different forms that interest me, uh, like performance, uh, photography, sound, moving image, staging, and also this rather uh, particular link to the space and to the way of diffusion. I would like also to precise that without my team, my films cannot exist. Alone, it will be impossible for me to produce my work, and this is why I would like to introduce you later Paul Gilbert, who was in charge of the post-production of Babsepta, and especially uh, the, all the FX uh, part. Uh, it is important to, for me, to me, to talk about the anecdotic part of, of this project because it helped me somehow into my desire to want to uh, work on this topic, maybe. Ceuta is a territory that I have frequented uh, since my young age because my father was a customs inspector. Besides, many people of, in my family work in this field, as well as in transit, import and export and so on. I lived for several uh, years in the region of Tangier and studied four years in the National Institute of Fine Art in Tetuan, in Morocco. I have always been marked by the Spanish influence in this region almost omnipresent, strongly found in the regional dialect, the way of living, and especially in the culture of consumption. In December 2015, I had the opportunity to stay at Trancat Art Residency in Tetuan, and I spent three weeks uh, returning on foot and by car to watch this ballet of individuals around the border of Ceuta. The dynamics of movements, the plastic and visual appearance of the passage, the characteristic situations of waiting and gestures immediately interested me. In this film, my will is to transcribe this transcribe pardon, this particular tension felt on this small territory separating Africa from Europe, but also more general state of the world. Ceuta is a Spanish enclave in the Moroccan soil, lying in an area about 18 square kilometer, located in northern northern Moroccan territory. In this film I was interested uh, in specific situations taking place in Bab Septa and its surroundings, as well as the way in which this geography produces a very special, a special time experience. Because it is strictly forbidden to take picture at, at the border, I chose to, to build this project in more conceptual way. The film was shot in Asla, a very small town uh, not far than Tetuan, and we had the transformed uh, a part of an old mortadella factory to a studio. The protagonists were people who actually worked at the border and whom I asked to reply their, or their uh, own role. The film was shot with two different points of view, zenith and the frontal one. The choice of the zenith point uh, view seemed important, adequate, and fairer to analyze subjects related to the question to, to the separation of two territories. It allows to realize the characteristic dimension of the project. It can recall the architecture, the topography, but also the monitoring. The frontal traveling allowed me to obtain the delicacy of the details and the situations, but also leave a place to the human figure and reveal the faces. There were very, very big work of post-production. The film is composed only of still shots. All camera movements are virtual. The floor drawings and signage have been added by, a, by, a, by Paul. There are around 80 shots in the film. Each shot has been staged in a rectangle of up 
approximately 50 square meter. There were two cameras, one in eight meter high from the stage, one on the a frontal stand seven meter away from the stage. Only one car could fit in the frame. Each car is shot that has been stuck to the other car and so on. And each group of people is a shot that has been stuck to the other group of people and so on. It is compositing made of collage. Hi, uh, so I'm Paul Gilbert. I'm the VFX director on Bab Septa, and I also did most of the VFX myself. Um, the question of the anim of animation in this particular project is rather interesting because it's mostly the materials, at least, is mostly live action footages. So um, yeah, it's it's like this little scene that Honda shot back in Morocco, and focusing on a special specific gestures, specific actions, uh, and specific spaces that uh, are reenacting in a way, uh, reproducing some things that uh, actually are actually happening in, uh, in Bab Septa. And yeah, the question to me was, uh, how can we still uh, talk about animation? Or to, to what Rhonda's movie is actually giving this anima, this soul, this um, form of, yeah, a feature of life. And since they were already on the live footages, it was by animating something else. Uh, something other than the characters or uh, the scene themselves. It was, uh, while working, I realized it was w by animating two things mostly. Uh, the first thing was the territory itself. By patching together this, those um, 50 meter square uh, 4K shots, uh, we were like trying to bring back the anima of uh, can say the forbidden image of this territory and this was through uh, what is probably to this day the biggest compositing I've ever made uh, the three kilometer square shot of actual space were like 260,000 pixels square so even in uh, After Effects in uh, the space of a single After Effects composition it wasn't enough so we had to skip to another software uh, 3D based software blender to patch all this all together uh, and we had to like adjust the timing of the compositions of the of the of the scenes so for instance the character going in and out the shots were fitting with the the nearby shots and so the territory would have like a a working life uh, so something like uh, yeah giving back this once again animat to the, the, this fictional virtual territory. So Rhonda could set in what I consider to be the second main animated feature. The second thing we had to give anima to was this, we can call it a gaze, this, um, this drone-like camera movement that is both, both a, a surveillance camera and also something that is showing us, revealing us this territory. Uh, these all, all these scenes and in a way it became to me like a, a, a virtual regardeur uh, and that's why I find really interesting this by that Rhonda is pushing us as an audience to interrogate uh, what is shown to us and what position we occupy uh, as part as a bigger political issue so that was a big part of the work to write this movement as something that is both both revealing and hiding um, those scenes by this plan sequence movement movement among the shots and to do that we have to synchronize that gaze uh, between the spectator the audience and uh, and the territory and also, I remember that Honda showed me some drawings uh, while we were working uh, during the process. Drawings of worker that she interviewed back in Bab Septa. And those drawings were all producing some kind of altered territory stretched by memory, but also by uh, the way the territory is felt and lived. And I kept that in mind while working because animation was a way to bring to reality something that couldn't be shot and it needed in a way to stay in this board on this border between 
reality and a vision. Welcome to the Priya Softonical Computer Animation Category Online Awards Ceremony. I'm Emiko Ogawa, head of Priya Softonica, and here is our artistic director, Gerfried Stoka, as a prize <laughs> presenter. And uh, we welcome the wonderful guests via online, Miwa Matleyak from US, Rwanda Marufi from France, and Maya Gaelic from Switzerland. So the computer animation category is the, has been the part of the, the Priya Soktonika since the beginning of 1987, and still it's the development continued to display the strength and vitality. So the, in the meantime, so now all animation is moved throughout on computer at the same point. So the jury members was asking the question themselves that what some point the um, animation is or what animation could be so for the first time since inception, the jury, mem jury meeting itself was held entirely online. So what kind of artistic exploration the jury selected? Which kind of technological um, challenge are acknowledged? So they are really discussing about the project carefully via online. And the result is, so Gerfried, please announce our, and introduce our winning project <laughs> and winners. The result is, as always, amazing. <laughs> uh, we have in this category 15 awards that we are giving away, 12 honorary mentions, two award of distinctions, one golden icon. And here you see this wonderful selection of really exciting projects reaching from different kind of almost classical animation to digital imagery and even installations are part of this uh, selection of the honorary mentions and I can only welcome you again and recommend that you look on our websites to see more about this really great project. But we are coming now to the top three and first to the award of distinctions and the first award of distinction goes to Maya Gehring from Switzerland for her animation Average Happiness. And Maya is with us online, and uh, I hope she can 
hear me because we would like now to ask you, Maya, if you could explain a little bit about your project. We are showing the video and we hope for your comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, Average Happiness is about statistical diagrams that turn into bodies and get uh, to a sensitive erotic state. So basically in that film, seven minutes long, the statistical diagrams come to a mutual data climax. And um, the topic of the film is maybe um, to be surrounded about statistical diagrams, to, to try to, to read and to, to understand those diagrams. And especially in our time, as we are now, we are surrounded by diagrams that we try to understand and we try to, to find, uh, yeah, uh, our, our way in these situations. And for me, it was interesting to have these very objective diagrams. They try to be very objective and give them an own subjective life and an own story and own characterization. Well, at the moment or during Corona, we have all seen so many data animations and diagrams. So it's really great uh, to uh, see the very wonderful and also humorful way that uh, you have to approach data. Are you usually working a lot with data visualization? I'm an absolutely naive person about data and data <laughs> visualization. And I tried to keep that during the process of making the film. Um, I did some research, but I tried really to get that uh, non-data visualization approach because they want to explain something, they want to make something understandable. And basically what I try it, with the film is to, to make it not understandable anymore and to give the subjectivity and the insecurity that I feel in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, to manifest yeah. this uh, this feeling with the, with these diagrams. Wonderful. I think this is actually very revealing about the nature of statistics and data. Very often we get a kind of false uh, impression of security from this data. So thank you very much for this really exciting thank you work. Thank for the prize. <laughs> The next award of distinction, second award of distinction this year goes to Randa Marufi for her animation Bab Septa. And again, we will try the same thing. So I would like Randa to explain a little bit about uh, the project while we are showing the video. Hello. Hello. Uh, Bab Septa means Ceuta's gate. Um, Ceuta is a Spanish enclave on the Moroccan soil. The film Bab Septa is kind of portrait of this city of Ceuta through the people uh, who works in this border every day. Because it is uh, strictly forbidden to take pictures at the border, I decide to shoot uh, the whole film in a studio. So in this film, my will is to transcribe this particular tension felt on this small territory separating Africa from Europe, but also more general state of the world. Really great. Maybe we can hear a little bit of the sound also of this video for a few seconds, because that's also an important part. Otras de tráfico de ropa usada. Or even the traffic of people who are escondidas in the interior of the car. How long did it take you to realize this project? Randa, can you hear me? How long did it take you to realize this project? Uh, uh, from 2015, I was there for the first time uh, just to visit this, uh, this border. Um, from 2015 till 2018, it was the preparation of the project. And the shooting was in 2018, and the post-production was a very big part of uh, the project, and it, it takes uh, um, around one year. Wow. That's really amazing, and the result is really stunning, a project that everybody liked very much in the jury, and also when we presented it here in Linz, it really got a very great feedback. So thanks again, and congratulations for getting this award of distinction. And we are coming to the Golden Licker now. This goes to Miva Matrejek for a wonderful film and animation called Infinitely Yours. Miva, 
congratulations first of all and uh, same procedure hello we are showing the video and we would like you to talk a little bit about it while we are showing the video great um, yes, so I'm Mia Matraic. I'm an animator, designer, and performer based in Los Angeles. So the key is that I'm also performing in my animation. Um, I come from a background in making animation, mostly in After Effects, but I am projecting it from um, front and rear projection, and I'm behind the screen creating a shadow with my own body as a performer. So I'm integrating my shadow as part of the composition of the layered animation, and I'm interacting with the animation. Um, so normally I perform in a theatrical capacity and normally in like black box theaters and you know live in front of an audience um, and this piece is sort of dealing with my climate grief over the last few years um, kind of inspired a lot by headlines and articles and news items that I was reading over the last few years about overfishing and plastics in the ocean and um, peak oil um, you know, like super, super storms and uh, unprecedented wildfires, which is happening again right now in California and along the West Coast. Um, so kind of taking all these different uh, like headlines and news items and how do I kind of like deal with my grief and express it as a series of images in a 26 minute performance. Um, so yeah, I made it over a year and a half or so. Um, and the process is very integrated where I'm testing images with my body and performance while I'm creating the animation. Mm -hmm. When did you start to work with animations in your performances? I mean, coming from Seattle, one would expect the stage is your primarily uh, area, but you are combining performance stage and projections and animations now. Um, it's actually opposite. I come from a background in animation and I started integrating performance into oh, my animation. Okay. Yeah, so my MFA is in excellent animation from CalArts in California. Um, but in the process of being in school, I started collaborating with people from theater, dancers, musicians, and starting to build pieces that have animation but integrate performers. Um, so I've been making work like this since 2006, seven or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you see in the, the, uh, something I would be very interested, this integration of uh, genres like theater with computer animation, digital art. I mean, there are a lot of theater groups now who are looking mm -hmm. into this kind of collaborations. Is this something that you think that has a, a future or is it just a temporary trend? Um, I think there's a future to it um, in terms of just the kind of worlds and surreal worlds they could create through projection and combining it with theater. And I think for me, with my own work too, um, it's about being able to be in a fantastical space, but um, keeping a very um, empathetical kind of connection with a live audience between a live performer and a live audience. Um, and sort of the, the stakes of it being a real person and possibilities for mistake rather than something that's just all pre-made in the can, you know, on film. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I do really enjoy performing and kind of sharing this empathetical space with live audiences, which mm -hmm. of course we can't do right now, which I think we'll talk more yeah. about later. But. Yeah. Well, anyway, this I think is also a great way to uh, bring this uh, notion of storytelling that we know from theater and performance uh, into the digital media now, because it's uh, really offering a, a great way of uh, presentation. And uh, what about the music? Are you also working on soundtracks for these pieces? For, for my work? Yeah, for your work. Uh, is how important yes, um, is music? Because, of course, in the, in the field of performance and animation, we have a strong aspect of, of music as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so for Infinitely Yours, all the music was um, by my friend Morgan Sorn. Um, and he's an LA-based uh, vocalist and musician. Um, and for some of my past work, we've had live music um, with a small quartet or a quintet. Um, I also have a theater company that's separate from my solo work called Cloud Eye Control. So for that group, sometimes we have live musicians. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I've worked with recorded music by friends. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. And how important is then improvisation in this? Because usually animation is a painstaking work of planning frame by frame. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Performing is of course something, of course you need a lot of choreography and preparation as well, but how is the, the, the moment of in, uh, in, uh, in, um, um, improvisation then mm -hmm. taking place? Sure. Yes, um, for my own solo work, so for example, Infinitely Yours, it is pretty choreographed because I am coming from an animator's heart, so I, I want control over every frame mm -hmm. and every, <laughs> you know, every like pixel, even with my shadow. Um, there's some room for improvisation in terms of like how I perform my expressions and, you know, you know, it's not exactly the same every time. Um, but like I said, you know, I have other collaborations that I do work with, and with that, there's more room for improvisation where the the images might be more reacting to the performer rather mm -hmm. than the performer kind of being choreographed to the images. Um, so it kind of runs a, diff a, a spectrum of um, working for me. Great. But yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And the uh, last two minutes, we are now <laughs> making the official uh, awarding. So we have this wonderful two certificates for the uh, two uh, awards of distinction. We will send them with the mail to you so that you, <laughs> will, ca uh, you will have the op opportunity to enjoy it. And from Eva, for you, we have this wonderful statue. Since 1987, it is given away to the prize winners of Pre Ars Electronica. This one is yours. Tomorrow we will put it in a box and send it all the way to you. <laughs> so congratulations again to all the three of you. I hope uh, we have more chances in the future to showcase your wonderful work here at the festival. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Congratulations you again. Much. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, the Cyber Arts Exhibition, which is the, the showcase of our winning project, is also available in Linz and in Okako to Kotia. <coughs> and also the visit video tour of this Cyber Arts Exhibition is available online. The next program is the Play for Long Computer Animation, the discussion part with this, so all three uh, top three winners and the jury members. So Miwa, Randa and Maya, thank you very much again and congratulations again to all winners of computer animation category 2020 Pli Asoktonika. Bravo, bravo. <laughs>
for us to get a little bit more in depth into each of your works, uh, but to also maybe use your work as a platform to jump into uh, larger topics as each of your artworks do. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is an opportunity to be able to have uh, more casual, more in-depth conversations. Um, and before I, I share a little bit about myself and the other jury members, um, uh, I'd like to go around and, and give each of you an opportunity to uh, introduce yourself. I'm, I'm actually, since we're going to be talking a bit about more global topics, social, political issues, I'm curious where each of us is coming from. Um, uh, it's perhaps to start with Miwa. Miwa, where are you beaming in from? Um, I'm beaming in from Los Angeles, um, where the skies are kind of yellow and orange. Not as bad as San Francisco or Oregon, but it could definitely still sm smell smoke here. And in Chicago, it's the afternoon and the skies are gray and it's soggy. Um, Maya, Maya Gerig, uh, where are you uh, tuning in from? Actually, I'm in Zurich, in uh, my home and there are strange insects flying around. <laughs> so uh, everything it, okay. <laughs> things are still alive. There's bugs in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Randa Marufi, where, where are you joining us from? Actually, I'm from uh, Morocco. I grew up there. And now I live since 10 years in, in France, in Paris. Uh, and uh, Paul Gilbert, who uh, was working with Randa, on uh, Bob Septa. Welcome, Paul. Where, where are you tuning in from? Where's your green, your chroma key void actually exist in the world? It's in, in my, little, my little mail cave in Brussels. Cool. So we, we have quite the international network here. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm tuning in from Chicago and perhaps we'll get a chance to dig into this a little bit, but obviously uh, with Ars Electronica happening online, there's lots of limitations of a movement that once felt normal just a year ago felt very normal. And so while some of us are experiencing a festival in real life in Linz, there is those of us like Miwa and myself in the United States who don't even have an opportunity to go to a cinema. Um, and so perhaps we can dig into that a little bit later, but I'd like to ground um, ground this topic in the, this is a, an opportunity to, to honor uh, the awards that you guys all uh, received um, and to offer a little bit of background on uh, where I come into this um, and the process uh, that was involved in choosing your work. So I was a jury member and our jury was all online because this happened post, uh, post uh, birthing of this global pandemic. Um, but joining me on the jury uh, were a number of artists and curators and multidisciplinarians, Mimi Son, uh, Eric O, oh, Birgitta Hosea, and Mathilde Leven. So I want to give a shout out to all of them. It was a really uh, incredible opportunity to get to look at all of your work and, and so much more, so much work, and to get to discuss it with each of them. Now, the, the topic of this conversation um, is what is animation? Um, and more particularly, how do each of you animate the work? Now that's such a big, uh, it's such a big platform to dig into. Um, so maybe to start, uh, if we go around to give to give each of us an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper, um, to describe the process of each of your projects, um, thinking about films, performances, or uh, hybrid media that we make. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit, um, not just about the process of animating the film, but all of you involve a lot of different processes. So I'm curious to also hear about uh, what does pre-production look like in your in your process? Um, what are the various production techniques? All three of you, four of you, have very different techniques in the in the films. Um, and then, of course, who else was involved? Um, I, I, with all of your work, I doubt that you all are making work exclusively in, in a cave. Even though Paul, you're. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe we can start with Randa and Paul. Could you guys uh, uh, share with us a little bit of that background on Bob Septa? Yeah. I will just uh, um, start to uh, 
talk a little bit about the post-production and then uh, Paul will, uh, will turn me to talk more about the anima animation of the film. Actually, Bab Septa uh, is composed only of uh, still shots. All camera movements are virtual. The floor drawings and signage have been added by Paul in post-production. Um, it was very, very uh, big work of, uh, of post-production because um, um, it was, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, there is no ca camera uh, movement during the shooting and, uh, and we added in, in, uh, in uh, we created uh, in post-production. Um, there are around uh, 80 shots in the film. Uh, but with two cameras, one frontal and one uh, uh, zenithal. And each shot, shot has been uh, staged in a rectangle of approximately uh, 50 uh, square meter. And um, the, the, the zenithal camera was like eight high uh, from the stage and uh, the, the frontal camera was um, seven meter away from the stage. So in total, I think that it was like 160 uh, uh, sequences, uh, shots. And then Paul has to manage with these uh, two kind of shots to have some uh, continuity uh, uh, for the movement. Um, just an example, uh, only one car uh, could fit in, in the frame. So uh, each car is a shot that has been stuck to the other car and so on. And also each group of people uh, is a shot that has been stuck to the other group of people and so on. So thanks to the software, uh, we created a new three kilometer, uh, square kilometer map of the city of Ceuta, uh, but not in 3D, but only using still camera shots. So it was a, a totally compositing made by collage and maybe Paul can uh, talk uh, uh, more about uh, this part. Yeah, so I, I took these little shots but that were not quite that little. They're all, every, each one of them were like a 4K shots and I have to stick, stick, stick them together. So it was like a two, 200, I think 60,000 pixel square composition at the end. That was the biggest composition I've ever made. So this territory came to life and was in fact animated at the end. I don't know if you have more time, but maybe it's enough for now. Yeah, and uh, perhaps we can, uh, something, a, a piece of wisdom that was once told to me as a, a young animator is that once you actually finish making the film, the work, the performance, you're actually only half done. Um, what needs to be done after that is to actually share it and show it to the world. But we'll, we will, of course, have a chance to come back to that. Thank you, Randa and Paul, and again, congratulations. Um, Maya Gerig, uh, could you uh, give us a bit of insight into your process of uh, making this film? Yeah, I mean, Average Happiness is quite different from the other films that I made because normally I have an idea and then the, the animation techniques come out of that. So I did children's film that were very classic with storyboard and animatic. But with this project, it was clear from the start that there was no possibility in doing storyboarding or, or animatic because I just wanted to use these diagrams and um, take them actually from the internet so the whole material average happiness is based on is uh, found footage from the internet all these um, diagrams exist and I somehow copied them in Illustrator and animated them in After Effects so basically the process was also kind of a collage in a different way because I wanted to show many different diagrams to avoid one topic. I mean, it's about the overdose of statistical diagrams that we are surrounded, the idea that you can explain everything in the world by statistics. So there was needed this kind of... Uh, uh, layouts, uh, hundreds of layers of different um, diagrams and then it was more or less all the uh, layers that create the narration or the humor in the film were adding, added during this process. Like the, the framework of the, of the PowerPoint presentation where you doze off into an erotic world or just like the, the sceneries 
I had certain sceneries that were quite clear from the start that they would stay in the film, otherwise others uh, I threw them away. But I was like um, working on all uh, production layers at the same time. I did uh, layouts, I did sounds already, like sound effects, um, atmospheres. And then basically also my composer, Joy Frampong, she was also starting with the music composition from the start. And I think that was very important that the music and the image in this film are somehow created together and, and really uh, getting a unity to transport this feeling of this dry statistics being something central in the end. And something beautiful that is completely away from their original purpose. Thinking about, uh, that's really interesting to hear that you didn't storyboard, you didn't use storyboards to structure the flow of the <laughs> film, because it is a very, the film is about, in a way, structure. There's a, it's a PowerPoint mm -hmm. that, that unravels. Um, I want to shout out that on the Ars Electronica website that um, all three of you um, have artist talks, uh, like 10 minute artist talks that people can tune into. Um, and something that I think is really important, Maya, about your artist talk is that they're visuals that accompany everything. <laughs> you feel that part of that unraveling of the PowerPoint structure is uh, I'm curious how much of that is chance operation because you feel these psychedelic visual connections and sonic connections that, uh, that are unendingly surprising. Yeah, it was a long process and I also had help from, I, I was working together with Paul Bush, who is an experimental filmmaker since the 80s. And it was very important to have a sparing partner to test ideas because I, at a certain moment, I was so fed up from this imagery that uh, <laughs> it was very difficult to understand what works and what not. And of course, we were testing it also with other people, but it was really important to talk about it a lot and to find the consistencies still if it feels like there are many different ideas there is a whole structure behind it and the whole idea of how you could tell such a story well you managed to pull off making infographics a lot less boring <laughs> i hope so <laughs> <laughs> uh and and last but not least uh miwa matreyek uh who won the golden nika with Infinitely Yours. Miwa, could you um, dig into a little bit, uh, sh share some of your insights, a little bit of background on your process, pre-production process, your production techniques, and who is involved in making one of these uh, theater, animation, stage show, video works? It's hard to describe because you're pulling from so many places and histories and techniques. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, so in terms of the pre-production, um, I don't really storyboard, but I kind of did for this one in terms of just kind of uh, drawing on note cards with ideas about compositions, like very kind of, you know, rough drawings. I'm not, I didn't really come from a drawing background. Um, but then kind of having these cards that I could kind of put in the order. Um, from pretty early on in the process of making the work, uh, I connected with my friend Morgan Sorn, who, um, whose music I'm using throughout the whole piece, throughout the 26 minute piece. Um, so I was able to kind of make like a sound score by putting, placing these cars in the time to kind of start to get an understanding of the arc and the structure that I wanted to create. Um, and I was talking um, earlier in the interview about um, a lot of the images are uh, inspired by news items that I've been reading over the four or five years um, leading up to last year um, and that I had been kind of cataloging um, in an app called Evernote, just kind of like copy links and some images to be like, oh, I want to make sure that I include a, a section about, you know, like drowning in an ocean full of plastics or a section about um, like drilling for oil and stuff like that. Um, so that was kind of like a mental marker of all the things that I wanted to create. Um, and in terms of making the work, um, I come from a background in collage. Uh, so again, I think everyone said collage in like the funny. Process. <laughs> yeah. But um, the yeah, so the process is very much uh, like a lot of things that I had shot, photos and videos, a few found things that I really took apart and rebuild into new images. Um, and 
And then, of course, the performance itself is almost like a collage because I'm combining cinema and theater and my own body is sort of like becomes this cutout, almost like a cutout silhouette that's inside of these layers of projected animation. Um, so in the process of making the work, uh, you know, because it's about climate change, it's like about my climate grief. It's about just me dealing with my overwhelm of, um, you know, the trash that I create and plastic waste that um, that I've created and sort of in the process of the piece kind of like having to come to terms with that and you know trying to reduce my plastic waste because I'm like well I'm making this piece where I shot loops of all these like yogurt containers and and you know plastic cups and stuff and I need to figure out how to not to have this anymore um, but so the image you know all the plastic that's floating in the ocean is like my own actual trash um, well some was pulled out from the apartment's uh, blue bin blue bin, like the recycling bin, but, um, and yeah, so there was a lot of things that I shot in the process of making the work, as well as a lot of footage that I found in my, in my iPhone from like, you know, three, four years ago where I was on a road trip and came across an oil field or, um, a river or waterfall that I saw like years ago that I kind of scrolled back and like found the footage and, and composite it into the images. Um, you, so I feel like there's a lot of my life kind of integrated into the piece as well. It's, it, it's interesting to recognize the role of collage in all of your films. There's this sort of stitching together and piecing together. Miwa, when you're talking about, I, I can't help but reflect, thinking about your process, you're literally digging through trash, right? <laughs> there's literally this, this process of digging through the detritus and the material that's around you to sequence something. Now, I, I think it's important with the, uh, and the three of you have made really different works, but um, this being a, a category for computer animation, it's animation, uh, we're dealing with time, right? And so one, one way that I think about the difference between a conventional collage, I have some collages up here in my apartment uh, that are great ambient works that are constantly unfolding, but they're literally static. Um, as filmmakers and performers, we have to deal with time. Um, how do you, how, can you talk about your process of actually sequencing these, uh, like how, how do you actually come up with the sequence? Because all three of you, your work has um, really incredible flow and in different ways with Bob Septa, there's something very sobering about that. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, perhaps we can return to that because I'm curious about your background that produces uh, a sequence like that. But to Miwa, to hang out with you for a minute, could you share with us a little bit of your process of coming to terms with what ended up being a really incredible, uh, what is it, about a, a 30 minute sequence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the piece is 26 minutes. Uh, I mean, it, it's a very back and forth process because I am using a physical body. So, you know, there might be, uh, I think there's timing of animation and like a logic of like cinema but then I have to make it work with the physical body and the physical limitations of what my body could do in like <laughs> a second or, you know. So there's a lot of um, back and forth where I would make like a mock animation and then project it in my living room. I could set up the projection, the projectors in the screen in my living room to test throughout the process of making the work. Um, so then I would like test it and be like, okay, I, I, I literally, I physically can't do this transition. Interesting. Um, so there's a lot of pushing of that. So I, I feel like there's sort of, like I said, the music really helps to kind of build an emotional arc because I'm really building the um, sort of like the energy based on the music, again, by my friend Morgan Sorn. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I feel like there's like a tension that I was trying to navigate throughout of the musical tension and arc to sort of like the cinematic storytelling and sort of like the surreal intensity that I was trying to create visually, but then also what my body can do and and pushing my body. So I, I do do really quick transitions, but then having that be like kind of very visceral and intense and um, kind of jarring for the audience in some moments. That's very interesting to think of your body as being <laughs> a spine, the, the set of restrictions that creates the form of your, your piece. Uh, Randa and Paul, um, thinking of Bob Septa and the structure of that film, um, Rhonda, could you talk about your, your background? I'm curious what, um, uh, when I think about a history of computer animation, uh, your work is almost disguised as a, a documentary film. Um, I could almost imagine some kind of new drone technology producing that kind of imagery. Uh, could you talk a little bit about 
your background and the um, the process that you go through to come up with the sequence of the the story, the time, the time that you're you're creating for us as an audience. Yeah. Actually, I come from a fine art school. Uh, I was in fine art school in Tetuan, in Morocco, and then and our fine art school in, in France. And then in, uh, I have uh, deep, uh, post graduated from Le Frenois Studio National des Arts Contemporains in France, where I uh, actually started to, to make uh, films. And um, uh, this medium for me is, uh, um, I, fi I find myself very, um, free because it's a combination between performance, between uh, mise-en-scene, between sound, uh, image, uh, uh, animated uh, moving images, uh, photography. And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, in this, in the film, I can put everything that interested me. As I, I'm, not, I'm not coming actually from cinema uh, background, special, um, except in Le Frenois where we have, uh, we were like um, many, uh, uh, profile uh, of people. Um, so yes, for me, the, the, now I think the film, but also photography, it's uh, the medium where I can find, the, I feel more comfortable to put everything uh, inside. Um, and for Beb Septa, uh, I actually couldn't ma made, uh, um, there is a lot of material in this border and I couldn't uh, put everything in the film. So this is why I choose to also think the, this um, project in uh, more in other for, format, other medium like uh, uh, drawings, like uh, photographs and uh, like performance and uh, uh, others, other um, mediums. But the film for me was uh, the, the, most, uh, uh, the, the most important piece around this uh, topic. And then uh, what, all what I couldn't put in this film, I tried to, uh, to do it in other medium. And by the way, with Paul, we worked also about, um, about a book, a sound book. Uh, that I still I'm still working on it, uh, where I, I I try to put some uh, um, drawings and also sound. So we there will be a book of Bob Septa that we can look forward to. Actually, it will be a book uh, of um, of some drawings. Nothing really. It's it's uh, um, the 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 question of representation, but uh, not uh, um, with photography. It will be drawings and uh, with sound. That all the sound that I didn't use in the film, I would like to re recycle it, to recycle. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to think about um, I, knowing a little bit of background in your project. Something about Bob Septa when I think about it as a plot of land, it's literally what, what Paul has done in, in this green screen cave. I don't know if that's where you actually work, but you've created a map. And in a way, the sequence of time that the audience goes through, uh, kind of, is, is, it, is that what defines the extent of that map? Or Paul, did, did you actually create a space in software that extends much further outside of the frame that the audience has access to? Actually, it was a bit of a, a bit of a headache <laughs> at some points because we were, yeah, the territory has had his own, his own life at some point because of the duration of the, the shots and the sequences. So when Honda was asking for us to, when we were writing the movement of the drone, uh, we were, con there, was, there was some constraints about what the shot were showing, about characters going in and in and out the shot that we couldn't show. So we had to manage between the time of the territory and the time of the, this floating camera. So yeah, not much that you don't see in the movie because we made only what we needed. <laughs> we don't make more territory than what we needed. As a fellow animator, I can appreciate the, the uh, the amount of material that needs to end up in the final cut. You don't want to waste anything. No. <laughs> um, we actually just have a few minutes left. Um, and so I, I, I want to kind of shift gears and, and think about some of these kind of larger issues. I, I alluded earlier to this idea that once you've actually made your artwork, your film, you're only halfway done. Um, my belief is that um, the artwork is produced when an audience engages with it. And so to think really specifically about this moment that we're in, where the cultural landscape has changed a lot, um, where 
where for those of us that are not actually at the festival in real life, um, where can we experience the work that we're talking about? Where can audiences experience the your work? I don't know who wants to jump in. <laughs> Shall I talk? Please, Maya. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we still go for a traditional way to to. Uh, yeah, to, to do this whole after the film is finished thing. I just missed the word in English actually, Auswerten is in German. Because I mean, there, I hope still there is a life after this pandemic and then you want to sell your work maybe. And so you kind of, I, I don't put it online or do some other, um, yeah. And I also, it's not my decision. I have a producer and a distributor. <laughs> But uh, what is interesting about this whole online festival thing is at least, I mean, you are sending without receiving a reaction. And for me, that's something very difficult because I'm not such a digital person in the sense of interaction with people. Um, but still, I appreciate very much that the festivals are trying to find a way to distribute the work that we did. So there is an online version. There, uh, where people can see the work. Is it true that you're making a game or an interactive version? Yeah, actually, yeah, it's true. It was already planned from the start that you can actually stimulate your own diagram on your um, devices. So we are doing this now and, and that will be another, an, a completely other way of just distributing and finding an audience. Yeah, but still it is uh, possible, I think, there are now, at least in Switzerland, again, festivals taking place physically and the film was screened last week really in a cinema with real audience and it was just... So exciting. There is no replacement for that. Uh, Miwa, as a performer, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned uh, during the award ceremony that um, you made a new version of the performance, documenting it for Ars Electronica of the pregnant version of the performance. Uh, in this in this moment, um, I imagine you're not actually going on tour with the performance. How are you thinking about this this moment of sharing your work? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I've kind of had to kind of hibernate for two reasons. Again, the pandemic, <laughs> especially in the States, but also the fact that I'm currently pregnant and I'm eight months um, so I literally, like the recording that I did, I think was really the limit of being able to perform. I was like, oh, you know, getting <laughs> up and down. Um, but I mean, for me, the work itself is the live performance. It's really about, again, sharing this empathetical space with the audience. It's not a pre-recorded version. Um, it's about the audience being able to see me breathing and, mm -hmm. you know, like see each step and, you know, if it's a, even in a really intimate kind of um, space where it's like a gallery style, not on a stage, they can even feel me like drop to the ground and like, yeah. you know, they can feel the vibrations of my presence and they see me enter and exit as well. So, um, so we need know, to I, wait for that, for that. Yeah. IRL. I mean, you know, like right now I've had to show some documentation as well as um, do a lot of artist talks. So kind of keeping the, the topic of the piece alive. Mm -hmm. um, and um, by talking about it, I mean, of course, like talking about climate change and first there's a few school districts where they're integrating my work into their curriculum. So mm -hmm. talking about plastic waste and yeah. climate change. Um, and then they would have like they would watch my piece through right. video since and then the I would time... come in and talk about it in my process. Uh, excuse me, Miwa, since the time it's really uploading to our okay. session, I have to interrupt you. I'm so <laughs> sorry about it, but it's thank you very much for this. Um, wonderful talk that it's so interesting. I really would like to, to hear and keep the discussion for more hour and hour, but unfortunately <laughs> this is the, our, um, the last session of this t today's uh, Asoktonika Selection Channel. Thank you very much for joining, uh, joining that Miwa and Maya and, and Branda and Gibel. Thank you very much and congratulations again and thank you very much, Peter, for these things. Um, so yeah, actually, um, today, also as Peter mentioned, that from 
um, in our time, 8.30 p.m. in the Hagenberg channel, the Hagenberg University, the expanded animation channel, uh, we have the only one-time um, YouTube streaming of the electronic theater, which is called um, it's a tradition of to show the top 15 winning artist um, project it's shown so only one time so um, of course it's different and difficult for the time differences but hope that people can join it to see it traditionally also in Linz we show it in physically but this is also the difficult timing for this so the this as I mentioned this is the last session of today and hope that you join us tomorrow again at the, I hope also you get a lot of inspiration in your brain and so ex, um, excited. But at the final project is the beautiful piano concert by Maki Namekawa and the visualization by Koryo Please enjoy and see you tomorrow again.